Welcome to another lecture. Um, today we are talking about UK dance music culture and two things that are always mentioned are on the one hand Northern Soul and on the other hand the great peaceful summer of love in 88 but there's also a time in between and Mr. Greg Wilson from the Merseyside of Liverpool is a representative of that time and please give him a very warm welcome. So Greg, you've been a DJ for, I don't know, most part of your life in, in retrospect? Well, well, not really in a sense. I was a DJ from was, when I was 15. I started in the clubs and that was uh, 1975. And I stopped um, when I was 23, which was um, the end of 1983. And then uh, took like a 20-year break <laughs> and started again um, end of 2003. Yeah. And so I've been back doing it for like a couple of years now. So what, what was it like back in 75? It's pretty different to what has become like this uh, yeah. global phenomenon. Well, DJs well, yeah. traveling the world. These I mean, days. from a UK perspective, straight away, the, the, the major difference being a DJ back then was the fact that it was microphone based. You, you announced records, you know, you, there was no mixing at all. That was um, very much like a, a New York thing and not something that we were really aware of until around about kind of 77, 78, you know, we started kind of getting more of an awareness of, of New York culture. And we wouldn't really get a full awareness of it till, till the early 80s, but... So, I mean, the music at the time when I started DJing was, um, you know, like the dominant kind of dance music was soul and funk uh, that was being played in the clubs, and, and also it was the start of the disco era. Um, so, like the kind of early disco music, I say early, I mean, obviously you had the kind of Philly sound, like from, from about 73, 74, but, you know, like things like, um, Donna Summer's first hit, Love to Love You Baby, was January 76. That kind of started back end of 75, so kind of ties in a little bit with, with that period. But at that point in time, disco music wasn't like a, a genre as we see it now. We, you know, disco music was, was the music played in clubs and discotheques, mm. which was, was soul and funk, generally. So um, that, that's how we saw it later down the line. It, it kind of evolved into its own genre as such, and you know, and that's what a lot of people look back on as, as, as disco music. So, so that, that, that was the setting, you know, and that's how it started. I mean, I, I, when I started out, I started in, in my home area, which was um, in a place called New Brighton, which is opposite Liverpool on the River Mersey, just a small town. Um, I was a job in DJ, which meant I was playing uh, five and six nights a week, you know, like uh, playing a kind of wide span of music. I, w I was always aspired to be a black music specialist. Um, that's where my heart lay with music. Um, so but, how, how would you define it? Were you, were you playing like Northern Soul no, back no. in the day? I mean, there's a kind of misconception that, that in the 70s in the UK, that in the north of England, it was, it was all Northern Soul. I mean, Northern Soul was a big underground scene. Um, but there was, you know, for example, in Liverpool, the Northern Soul scene ne never took off at all. Liverpool was a much more funk-based city, I mean, mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the kind of music that I'd be playing was like contemporary um, stuff at, at the time. The, for example, on the funk side, you'd have people like Early Cool and the Gang, Ohio Players were big, James Brown, of course, and then, you know, like Parliament, Funkadelic, those George kind of Clinton. things were coming through. Um, so, so this was more, you know, the type of music that was being played in, in Liverpool at that particular point in time. Um, but could um, you still describe that Northern Soul phenomenon well, a bit yeah, for I mean, people who might not know it? Again, to put it in its context, Northern Soul is that it was, um, it was a, at the time, this is like in, in the mid-70s, it was a retrospective form of black music. It was, it was derivative of Motown. It was like almost that the people that were into Northern Soul, had, 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 they'd never let go of Motown. They, they'd love that music so much that what they wanted to do was they wanted to dig deeper and deeper and find you know, like rarer records with that kind of Motown feel to them. And at the time, uh, you know, like Motown was successful in the 60s, there was loads of artists in Detroit who were, who were trying to make Motown sounding records. And often the original musicians from those records were, were um, like moonlighting, doing other people's music and stuff. And so, you know, it, it, 
I, I think the Northern Soul scene started because, like, I mean, there was a club in Manchester called the Twisted Wheel uh, at the back end of the um, 1960s that, at that point in time, was playing contemporary soul music. Um, but then they started digging a little bit deeper and, and finding these rare records. And so by the time it got into the 70s, a, a scene had developed which was all about finding old records and rare records. And, you know, like the, the main clubs on that scene were places like the Blackpool Mecca, um, obviously Wigan Casino later down the line, the Torch in Stoke, the Cascombs in Wolverhampton, uh, these kind of places. Um, and, and, you know, a, a huge, you know, like underground scene developed around that. But what must be said about that scene, it was, um, it was predominantly white audience into retrospective black music. Whereas at the same point in time, the black kids in, in, in the UK weren't listening to old, uh, as they would have seen it, old music. Their parents. Why music. would they want to listen to 60s kind of, um, you know, like old 60s tracks when there was all this great contemporary black music? Like, I mean, obviously the 70s, like you had Curtis Mayfield, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder doing his greatest work, all the funk bands, the start of disco. And so it, it wasn't a scene that black people were, were um, involved in. They were more into, you know, like as I say, the, the, the kind of funk that was going on at the time. Um, so from where I actually lived, it didn't affect things so much. Of course, certain tracks came through and were played, but, you know, it wasn't, it was certainly not the dominant force. Mm. I mean, should I play something yeah, to, to give an nice. idea of, 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 like, a Northern Soul track? Um, I mean, this, this is quite, we, is the level open here? This is quite, um, you know, uh, an obvious one to play for you because <coughs> later it was a big hit that everyone should know by Soft Cell called Tainted Love. Um, this was the original version, it was by Gloria Jones. And <laughs> stuff like that played on a Northern Soul night. Um, although, you know, I mean, at the time, I was, I was by no means a specialist. I was playing like a lot of what would be seen as more commercial music at you the had time. To make I was just starting out. But this kind of stuff was played in. There was never a chart hit. But um, I mean, Liverpool at the time, uh, th there was a club I went to, I went to when I was 16, um, called the Timepiece in Liverpool. And it was uh, a real education for me. I'd heard about the club beforehand. And there was a legend about the DJ, a guy called Les Spain, um, who was um, a guy from Liverpool, but he'd, he'd been born in Sierra Leone. Um, he lived in an area called Toxteth. Toxteth in Liverpool was, was the black area in Liverpool. It was quite a segregated city and quite a racist city in many respects as well. But um, this night was like, uh, this club <clears throat> was in the city centre called the Timepiece. And it was a predominantly black audience. I was taken down there by some older DJs who I got to know. And where I lived in New Brighton, there, there were very few black people at all. And so going into that environment on a personal level, it was, you know, I can remember walking in there and thinking, am I, am I all right in here? Am I, am I going to be OK? But the music instantly made me feel at home. And I was introduced to Les, who was the DJ there. And he was playing, like, what we call a front black American music, imported music, stuff that wasn't released in the UK that they were buying on import. At the time, there weren't 12-inch singles, so most of the stuff was played on 7-inch or, or sometimes album tracks. And, you know, what was happening in there, you know, what I could see, that, that, that for a start, it was everything I wanted musically, you know, for, for, from a club. And the dancing as well, you know, it was like on a different level. People were there and seriously into... And, it was almost at that, at that second in time, I kind of, I saw the light. This is, this is where I wanted to be headed. This is, I mean, I suppose every, every DJ, I mean, there was like all sorts of DJs around the DJ box, like asking Les what he was playing and making notes and all sorts of things going on. So everyone was probably on that tip. He didn't cover up his labels? No, no, he was very open about it. His attitude was, it doesn't matter if you know what I'm playing because next week I'll have something different again to play for you. <laughs> he had that confidence in his ability. Uh, he, was, he was a wonderful DJ. Um, he went on to work for Motown. I mean, when Motown opened up in the UK, he went on to work there. Um, and, you know, he, he still works in the music business today. Um, and so identifying that, I mean, I was very fortunate that later down the line, it took me another five and six years, I ended up in Manchester with a similar audience and a similar vibe to, to what I saw that night at, at the timepiece. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I obviously had to go back into what I was doing at the time, which was trying to work towards a situation of 
building a crowd and, and working more of this type of music that I was into, into what I was playing. Because first and foremost, at that particular point in time, that you know, I saw myself as, as, a, as a professional DJ. I mean, I did it for a living. And this was at a point where, I mean, if, if somebody said to me, um, you know, like an adult said, what, what do you do for a job, like they used to say in those days, and I said, you know, I'm a DJ, but what do you do for a proper job, they'd say. And, then, and that was the way it was. When I started off, I earned six pound a night in the clubs. That's what you got it's not paid. not too much. You know, <laughs> and I was, happy with, I was happy with it. I was earning good money for somebody of, of my age, you know, like by putting the hours in and doing five and six nights. But, you know, eventually I took over a club called the Golden Guinea in New Brighton. And it was very, you know, commercially based club. But bit by bit, I worked with <clears throat> the people that were there and started playing some imports myself. And the whole disco thing was evolving at the same time. And pretty soon, I managed to evolve what, what might be called a, a scene, you know. Um, but that was due to the fact that you played there like almost every night then. Yeah, right? I mean, which so is... So you could educate. Well, I mean, I don't like... Uh, the, the term educate, I find that's a very high term to use because it's music such a subjective thing. I mean, what it is, is, is I think you bring in your personality in terms of music, you know, it, it, into play. By saying you're educating people, it's somehow presuming that you're somehow better or at a mm. higher, a higher, higher level. level. Um, whereas I always like to see it that you're working on a level with the audience, you know, that um, you need them as much as they, they need your music, you know, without them you know, nothing's going to happen. And so, uh, you know, I often saw DJs playing, ab ab you could say, above the, the heads of an audience, thinking that they were being really clever by playing all these new tunes, but missing the target completely with it. Whereas it, it's far better to kind of, even now, you know, I mean, you know, like, for example, I'm playing at the weekend in uh, Revolver, and I've never been to Australia before, so, I won't, you know, I've got an idea, obviously, of what I want to play, and, and I'm covered, you know, from quite a few bases, but I, I can't nail anything down until I'm actually in the venue, looking at the audience that's there, and then getting a, a feel for that. And, and, and that's almost a kind of an old way that dates back. I mean, I started off, even before I came into the clubs, I, I did mobile discos, and they were weddings and 21sts, and they were working with, like, you know, kids to grandparents and trying to balance, <laughs> you know, that audience. But the rules that you learn within that worked exactly the same as when later down the line that I went to Legend in Manchester, and I worked, was working with a predominantly black audience who totally knew their music and, you know, was a totally upfront audience. The same rules apply. You look at your audience and you cut your cloth accordingly to, to who's there. You know, you've got to kind of work with the people that, that, that you're with. And, um, and, and, and everyone, you know, you, you look on on their own situation. You're going into that environment and, you know, you, you've got to weigh that up and, and play accordingly to that. And so, you know, the, from, from that level, when I, when I went to the Golden Guinea Club, that I had a period of time where I could slowly, bit by bit, kind of, I suppose, impose my personality into the night. And eventually, you know, get it to a situation where uh, the nights I was doing that were regarded throughout the Merseyside area as, as, like, some of the best nights to hear, like, black music, which is, you know, was a great thing for me. I mean, the major thing was when, I mean, the main magazine uh, that reported on black music in the UK was called Blues and Soul. And it was like the DJ's Bible at the time. And, you know, it was a great moment for me when they eventually came to my little small town club to and did a out. piece about it and right. recommended it as a, as, as, as a club to go to. So, you know, that was working on that local level. And I, I, I love working there. I knew all the people. It was my hometown. And, you know, I, I was there, you know, till 1980. In the meantime, I've been to Europe. And I, I tried, there, were, there was a lot of English DJs at the time going out to Europe and working the, I mean, I went to Scandinavia, went to Denmark and, and, and Norway. Why was this? Uh, again, it, it, it was like, because a, a lot of the, uh, we're using the microphone as well, and it, it was seen that the, the English language was, was the language to use for mm -hmm. DJing. <clears throat> what, was, what was quite funny that I remember was that um, Sweden, you couldn't get a work permit in Sweden, so English DJs, um, you know, apart from working illegally, couldn't go out to Sweden. But Swedish DJs would announce the record in English on the microphone. 
But if there was a kind of announcement that, say, there was a taxi outside for someone, they'd do that in Swedish. <laughs> but the, the record announcements would always be in English, so it was kind of seen that way. Again, you know, the kind of mixing culture, this is 78, was just about kind of starting to, you know, make inroads. I mean, some places in Europe it took off earlier, you know, like um, the, the, this kind of microphone side of things uh, wasn't as, as prominent. Um, but in most places, I mean, for example, Germany, you know, there was a lot of English DJs out there and, and working work that scene. But f with regards to mixing, I mean, it's quite funny how that all worked out because when we first heard about it, right, and, and realised, right, this is what they're doing over in, in New York, they're mixing two records together. So we knew, like, how to do it, but we didn't have the equipment to do it. We didn't have very speed turntables. So to get two records running at the same time was try, you know, trial and error, very rare. Maybe get them running through a bar and then, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really take off initially. Um, a lot of DJs tried it and it was kind of flavor of the month, but then everybody just went back to, you know, talking on the mic as they'd always done. And it was seen as a fad that it wasn't going to catch on. It was, this was an American thing. And have, have you been to New York during uh, that time? No. No, no, I didn't go to New York till last year. It was my mm -hmm. first time. Um, That's pretty surprisingly <coughs> for someone yeah. who... With the influence yeah. that it's had down the years, you know. Um, and, I mean, I, I was like everybody else that I, I kind of tried mixing. Um, we used to always kind of do things like play three in a row, for example. Um, you know, just run three records, one after the other. We do that with like, things like Motown spots. You know, most DJs in kind of your mainstream clubs would you know, do a Motown spot and they kind of wouldn't, you know, talk between each of them, they'd play a few tracks together, but it wasn't really mixing as such. I mean, the first, the first time I ever run two records over the top of each other was two Motown records, and they were like, both Jackson 5, ABC, and I Want You Back, and there was like, at the start of ABC, there was this kind of section that, that was similar to a section in the middle of I Want You Back, and I used to kind of run them, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking of it as mixing at all. I think later down the line as well that uh, I'd do things like um, you'd have uh, the Thelma Houston and Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes version of, of uh, Don't Leave Me This Way, and I'd switch, somehow switch between them. I mean, probably if I went back in a, a, you know, like a, a time machine and listened, it sounded <laughs> awful, but, you know, it seemed like it was flowing at the time. And back everything. then it was all right. But, you know, the, the, the mixing thing never caught on at that point in time, and it wasn't until later down the line that I was at Wigan Pier and Legend and had the right equipment to work with that it all started to make sense and you know from a personal level you know that's when I, I placed the emphasis on that but still I'd say from a UK perspective that the, the majority of DJs were not mixing until the back end of the 80s mm -hmm. until the house era started. Stuff took on. So what kind of stuff were you playing at Wigan Pier then? Well <clears throat> What happened was that um, I, I went to Europe for a couple of months, uh, you know, as I say, in 1978. I was 18 at the time. Got very homesick, you know, it didn't kind of work out quite the way that I thought it would. Um, and I came back, went straight back to where, what I was doing before, the clubs I was at and everything. But then, you know, a couple more years passed and I thought, I actually thought, I mean, because I was working in this club, the Golden Guinea, and um, there was a DJ who worked upstairs and he played more kind of pop stuff and everything, which was good from my point of view, because if somebody came and asked me for a record that I didn't want to be playing, I could say, go upstairs, go upstairs and he'll play it for you. And, um, but he was, I think he, he was at that point in his, his, his 30s, and he'd been at, at this club for about 10 years. And it's like I, I almost saw myself and thought, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be, you know, in the same place in 10 years' time. And so I felt I needed to kind of change something. So I decided to try Europe again. I went to um, Denmark, and then I went to Germany. And the club I worked in at Germany was the, the first club that um, I ever worked in that had SL 1200s. And, you know, I, and then there was another club in a nearby town called, well, a city called Essen, a club called Librium. And it was a kind of small, compact club with a, a really great lighting system. And the DJ there was just constantly mixing and it made a big impression on me it, it kind of um, 
it's the first time that I'd seen, I mean, I'd see, the, the, there was like um, the first kind of English, uh, the first DJ in England to really mix was a guy called Greg James, an American who, who, who kind of knew, um, you know, like some of the people from New York and he'd come over to the UK. And I'd seen him at a club called The Embassy in, in London, um, but it hadn't made the same impression as this guy in Essen. I, in Essen. Do you remember his name? Well, I don't know. I mean, I've got a feeling it could be Peter Roma, but I don't know for certain. I kind of did a bit of detective work on it. Um, and he was like, obviously, like one of the, the, the early German um, mixing DJs. He came to England as well at some point. I know that he was around, um, you know, he, he actually worked, worked in that club at a certain point in time around that period, but I'm not, I couldn't be 100% mm. sure. And it just crystallized the idea in me that in the right situation at the right point in time that this was a direction that I could see myself taking. Um, while I was, um, I'd originally gone to Denmark and I crashed my car while I was over there. So I'd come back to the UK to change my car. Um, and while I was there, there was a guy that I'd met in Norway, way karma goes, when I got homesick, who was now working at a club called the Wigan Pier. And I went to see him at this club, and this club was like absolutely phenomenal for its time. It, it was the first club in the UK that had like a laser system. The, the DJ box was in this like 15 foot fiberglass frog, and they had a light controller at the front of the mouth of the frog looking out. The DJ worked to the side, there was a monitor system inside. All this was totally new. We'd no, you know, never seen the lights in the UK. Normally, the, the, the equipment that a DJ was using was like, you know, kind of an afterthought of, you know, like the club owners, it was the, 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 how the bar looked was more important than how the sound equipment mm. was in most clubs. And, but this club was absolutely geared um, towards like the DJ and it was an American style disco. It actually advertised itself as, as, as an American style disco. And so it was kind of, um, you know, it was influenced by what was obviously going on in New York and everything at the time. And I just thought this was a wonderful club. And they, he, they were opening a new club in Manchester called Legend. And uh, Nicky, who was the DJ there, was going to be opening Legend. There was going to be a vacancy at Wigan Pier. And I, I ended up speaking to the club owner, and, and, and he said, why don't you audition? Everyone wanted the job at this place. And I had to go out to Germany. And I didn't want to take the risk of not going to Germany for this audition, so I couldn't do it. But I said to him, could I send you a tape or something? And when I went out to, out to Germany, I managed to make myself a tape and sent it over, and Nicky probably pushed for you know, yeah, to, to hear it. And while I was there, they, they got in touch with me and, and they, they, um, they offered me the job. And I, I was absolutely blown away. I actually, I actually, I actually wept, I remember. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that this club, it was just, it was a dream club. And I was going back. I didn't really want to be away. I, I wanted to be in the UK. And now I had this fantastic club. And I went back as the four nights a week resident. And one of those nights, the Tuesday night, was at the time, it was like, um, it, was, it was the specialist music night, which was the jazz funk night. It was the jazz funk scene at that particular point in time. And so the other three nights were more, you know, a mixture of like the bigger tracks that were played, like on the, on the, on the, um, the jazz funk night. Also, a lot of the kind of futurist type stuff that was coming through at the time, um, like, for example, like Human League and. Um, like Spando Ballet, all that kind of early stuff. New romantics. So, yeah, the new romantic kind of thing was happening. Um, and, and also, at the weekend, you play the more commercial side of black music that you wouldn't play on the Tuesday night. For example, things like Shalimar um, and Michael Jackson, um, they wouldn't be played on the more specialist upfront nights, but they'd be played, they were seen as the more kind of pop side of, of, of black music. So do you have an example of the Tuesday night selection? Right. Yeah, I find something, um, like the, the, the jazz funk night was, I mean, you know, I mean, although it was jazz funk, it was also the big disco tracks at the time, the big funk tracks, the big soul tracks. Uh, and there was there kind of two, two sides to it. A, um, a typical jazz funk track. Right. Oh, that, that, this would work. Donald Byrd. Um, Typical kind of jazz funk vibe, Donald Byrd coming from like a jazz background but incorporating like funk into the style of the music. 
on the other side of that, there was more what later we call kind of fusion stuff that was, um, you know, a lot of Latin American stuff and, and things. Um, this was a huge track, Chick Corea, Central Park. In, in like the stuff that was played on the night. I mean, the, the, the type of stuff like the Chick Corea track, I mean, what, what you know, like, became a, a major part of the scene was like, what called Jazz Fusion Crews. And uh, dancing was yeah, very important. They were, they were mainly black kids, well, they were all black kids pretty much, and incredible um, dancing. Um, when I first kind of saw it, I couldn't understand properly why, I mean, it, it was very rare. I mean, you get like, um, some, somewhere like, say, say Wigan Pier, um, like, just to give you an example, I mean, it became more of a black audience as time went on. When I first went there, I'd say it was predominantly white kids that were, were there with, with a black presence. Later down the line, it was predominantly black kids with a white presence there. And Wigan, there is no, no black people live in Wigan. And this was a Tuesday night. Um, people would be travelling from like Birmingham and um, Manchester, Sheffield, even as far as London, uh, Huddersfield. And, there were crews of, of dancers as well within this who challenge each other and, you know, like... Very so it preceded that whole breakdance yes, culture? Yeah, and in fact, a lot of the original breakdancers in the UK came from jazz fusion crews. So they, once the breakdancing came through, the first kind of people off the mark in many cases were like the, the guys who were dancing to jazz fusion. And were you a dancer yourself no. or did you just <laughs> no, supply no. the music? No, no, not a dancer at all. Um, just supply the music, yeah. Um, but, I mean, watching it, you know, eventually you, you start to under understand the intricacies of w what was going on with the dancing and, and, you know, it was a serious, serious business, you know, like, um, with these challenges that, that were going on and everything. Um, and so, like, it was a very vibrant, like, intense scene, you know, I mean, uh, initially, as I say, I was at Wigan Pier and in those you know, kind of early, in that early period that was there where it was, it was like jazz funk dominated and everything that, um, you know, I mean, I mean, it was mainly the kind of style of music that we were talking about there. Then, because of the success of the Tuesday night that I was doing really well with, with, with the Tuesday nights, um, that legend in Manchester had, had the, their own jazz funk night on a Wednesday, which had been going okay, but then the DJ that they had there had left to um, take over a rival night and it, it basically kind of wiped it out you know that um, it was right down I think the first night I, wor I worked there there was like 70 people whereas the club held about 500 and so it was looking a bit, a bit kind of threadbare um, and when I went in there there was a big difference to Wigan Pier which was that those 70 people you know probably 69 of them were black and um, here was an audience that weren't really interested in a DJ kind of on the microphone, the, the kind Making of... announcements. The, the verbals of it, you know, like, um, it, was a mu it was very much music-based. And, and I just knew at that point in time, I made the decision that this is where I put the emphasis on the mix in. Um, and so, although I still used the microphone, you know, I mean, I didn't kind of completely put it aside. But what mm. kind of announcement? Well, I mean, you, you for, right, for example, I mean, like, one of the main things about the scene the, the, was the all-dayers, which happened on a Sunday or a bank holiday Monday, where all the big DJs from different areas came together on, on one bill and played, and, you know, their crowds came in, and it was like, so you'd have all these people coming in from different areas, and, and the all-dayers would run from maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon till midnight and, and stuff like that. And, you knew that you were making it as a DJ when you were booked to appear on the All Dayers. And so, around, you know, once I, you know, been at Wigan Pier for about six months, a couple of the promoters asked me to go on the All Dayers. And originally I was down the bill, and bit by bit I came up the bill. It was one of those that, so by the time, you know, that, um, you know, I was at Legend and stuff, you know, that, that that's where you'd use the microphone to tell people there's going to be an all-dayer in Birmingham next month and there's going to be a coach leaving from such and such a place and, you know, and what's going on there. Or, you'd, you know, announce some records. One of the things that I did do as well, I was a great believer. You, meant, you kind of touched on it before with when I was saying about Les Spain, did he cover the records up? And I was always a great believer in sharing the information about the record that you had. Uh, which I, th I felt was important to move everything forward. If people knew what... What you played. Yeah, then you can push the whole thing forward. So, 
when I decided that this, the mixing was going to take centre stage, it caused a bit of a dilemma. It was like, well, how are the people going to know what I'm playing? And what I did was um, I did a, an information sheet that every week was done. It was called What's Going On? And it had a floor fillers chart, which were the biggest records. It had a new releases chart. It had an information section saying, you know, as I say, what all day is, what things were happening. Almost like a fan scene. It was just one sheet of paper, and it was hand everything was handwritten. I had a kind of template for it, and just wrote out each week. Had it photocopied, you know, a thousand times or whatever, and it was given out at Wigan Pier and Legend and any other um, kind of specialist black music nights that I did as well later down the line. And how it worked eventually would be people would literally all they'd need to do is like as I was playing, they'd come up and they'd hand me the thing, and I'd know what they wanted. They wanted to know what record was on. I'd take the record off, they'd take that, they'd go into Spinning, which was the record shop in Manchester, they'd go, I want that record, and it was done, you know. And that was how it worked. So I managed to kind of solve that dilemma. I mean, funnily enough, later do down... Do you the still do that? Pardon? Do you still do No, that? no, I mean, I should do, actually. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's like, later down the line, I was asked to design a DJ booth, and one of the things that I had in there and I always thought this had happened in clubs, and it never happened, was, um, you know one of those kind of LED readout screens mm. where information goes along? Uh, that was part of it. That I, I thought that, you know, you'd type in what you were playing, and then people could see what was being played. And, but ne never came about. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was important, I, I felt, that this information was, sh was, sh was shared, you know. Uh, that was how I felt. I know some people like to keep, keep everything to themselves, and keep things exclusive, but um, not my way, you know, I mean, I, ca I can't really see the point, point of that, because it's, the music doesn't belong to you, you know, you're, sharing, you know you're, you're a channel, you're kind of giving this music out. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, with, but, um, with but now... Uh, it was always a pretty big part of DJ culture, right, to be like, uh, yeah. <laughs> very secret about no. what you play to distinct yourself from the other. The Northern DJ. Soul scene was very like that. It's still like that? Yeah. No Northern Soul, what they were doing there was they were actually getting records, finding a rare record, covering up the label and calling it something else. So giving it a completely different title and artist to what it was. And other DJs were getting caught out because they were putting them in their charts and it didn't <laughs> exist. And that happened quite a lot, you know. Um, That's mean. So, <laughs> so that, so, but it wasn't so much the same on, on the scene that we were involved in at all, you know, I mean, it was always... It, it was a real love of the music, and, and, and it was a real love of moving this music forward and sharing this music, and, uh, and there was a kind of connection with it in that, in that sense. We wanted more people to get into it. We wanted it to be successful, you know. Um, and so making this decision to place the emphasis on mixing, being at this club, Bit by bit, over the next six months, we picked up more and more people came in, more and more people. And then, you know, fate kind of takes over, and, and a kind of music starts to come through that is suited towards this mix, that's, you know, in, towards mixing. And this was the more kind of electro-funk-based stuff that was coming through. Like, around, I mean... How would you define electro-funk? Well, a lot of the stuff that was being played, say, in 1981, um, people had now referred to as, as boogie, you yeah. know, which, which we didn't call it that, we called it disco funk. It was, it was still a disco vibe, but it was a f the, the funk edge of it. Um, boogie was a term that derived later down the line in London. Um, they had a, a bit like the Northern Soul scene, their rear grooves and boogie scene was like, they were playing retrospective music. And, you know, that, that's where that kind of term was. So, but it's the same music. We were playing the same music. It's, it's, it's just that we weren't calling it that at the time. What, what was defined as electro-funk was that, that these new tracks started to kind of emerge that were utilizing the, the technology. It was like underground black music, predominantly from New York, utilizing the technology, be it drum machines and synths, later samplers and stuff like that. And they were also designed to watch towards DJing, right? Like well, having intros, outros, you could mix and more yeah, than I mean, like I don't Donald think Bird song. Not, not, in, not, in a, not in a similar way to what House would be later, where it would be a straight mm. you know, kick drum to let the DJ mix in. It wasn't designed in that way, but it, because it was drum machine based, a lot of the stuff, it was more suited for mixing. Um, 
as opposed to, you know, like what was before that, which was like obviously live musicians. So you, you were mixing to a live, a live drummer and that's got much more scope of kind of moving out of time, obviously, than, hmm. than uh, uh, I mean, one of the early tracks and, and funnily now, people would kind of uh, describe this as, as, as a, a disco track, um, as a disco classic, in fact. But when this track first came out, it sounded different. Um, it, it, was, it was a new sound. And um, it's D-Train, you're the one for me. I mean, again, with a lot of the stuff that we played, um, or certainly a lot of the stuff I played, I generally went for the instrumental or dub mix, because, I mean, you had... That was another thing of, of this time, was that with regards to the remix, and there was much more of an experimentation going on, and there was a drawing from like this kind of Jamaican influence from the, the 70s with like dub mix that, that was now coming into New York dance music. Um, but you're the one for me, like straight away with this, it's the kind of sound at the beginning, which was different. That was straight away the time that was on West End. I mean, the, the, the labels that were emerging, it's like the big labels from, you know, like with this new sound with things like Prelude, which D Train was on. Um, West End, Emergency, this Italian record, we didn't know it was Italian at the time, but another one. It was just, it was a revelation, I mean, born of pure open-mindedness, Africa Bombarda from the Bronx, you know, like, had the vision to be open-minded enough to listen to other sides of music. Kraftwerk. Got into Kraftwerk, started playing it so that kids, like, you know, like who would, would, wouldn't previously have like seen that as their style of music, were listening to it and listening to other things, you know, like that, that were kind of derivative of uh, that kind of whole electro sound. I mean, a lot of the British New Romantic stuff was being played, you know, like within the Bronx as well. And came with a new sound completely um, that revolutionized everything using TR-808 and, you know, completely electro sound Arthur Baker production revolutionary track, you know, straight out of space, you know, and, mm. and, you know, dance music would change completely as a result of that track. You know, it was a total hybrid for what was to come later. And um, a lot of your peers went into that when well, it came out? I, I know, I mean, it was like, they thought, what are you playing that shit for? You know, that is not black music. Why are you playing it? You're ruining the scene, you're polluting this scene by playing this music. And for me at the time, I mean, I would have been, what, 22? I just, you know, kind of arrived on this scene. I was doing really well. I had these two great clubs, Wigan Pier and Legend. It was going well for me. You know, the crowds were coming in. You know, uh, my ego wanted, you know, a pat on the back and aren't you doing well? And all of a sudden, the people who I respected and like my peers on this scene were totally critical of this direction that was taken. They thought it was, you know, a one minute wonder, it'd be, be here and gone and, you know, and I, I'd look stupid for having played this. I know that when I, the record shop I bought it from, because one of the biggest critics was the guy who sold me the record in, in Spinning, the manager of the shop. And I know that they would have looked at me and probably laughed at me walking out of the shop with that. <laughs> and look, look, you know, we got rid of it to, to And it, at first, you know, I mean, I was really on the defensive about this, uh, you know, it was like, I was into it, and w but what was most important was that the kids who came to the club were, were into, into it. it, and that was the main thing. And these people were saying, as I say, it's not black music, and then it kind of occurred to me properly what was going on here, that the people that were saying it wasn't black music were, were generally white people who were in the 30s who seemed middle-aged to me at the time. <laughs> and it was like... Who are, who are you to say what black music is? Ask the black kids what black music is. That's, that's what black music is, what they're into. And not only is this black music, it's the cutting edge. This is where it's at. This, they thought this was the music that was going to kill the scene, whereas really it was the music that was going to revive the scene. Because a lot of the stuff that they were kind of into at the time, they were kind of hanging on to the whole soul thing. And, I, you know, I remember like they were into artists like um, Luther Van Dross and Alexander O'Neill. They held up high on a pedestal. Great singers, great production, but everything was too perfect. It, there was a blandness about it that, you know, I, 
I love soul music, it's my first love, but it, it wasn't Otis Redding tearing it up and it was, everything was beautifully put together and it was too perfect, whereas this was raw. This to me had more in common with those great early soul records than, than what was the contemporary soul at the time. And so it changed things in me that, that it almost put me on the offensive about it. That, you know, I become proactive about, you know, the, no, you know, I mean, and, and went for this. And it was a rocky road for a period of time, you know, like, um, you know, I took a lot of criticism. I was seen as, like, you know, the heretic for, for doing this. But, you know, eventually, eventually, you know, you were bit proof, by bit, right. it, you know, it, well, it, the, you prove right by the, the virtue of the fact that this is the direction that people go on the scene. And, and I found myself in a position whereby, um, you know, my clubs, which were Wigan Pier on the Tuesday, Legend on the Wednesday, got voted first and second by Blues and Soul readers in the, you know, the North's Best Club category. I got the top DJ award. So we, we, it was a clean sweep that all of a sudden <clears throat> I, I was in a position of power on the scene. You know, the, the, what was happening in my clubs was dictating, you know, the whole scene within the North and Midlands, you know, like... Uh, so, and you like that, that to be in that position? Well, uh, of course you do, but, I mean, you know, I was, you know, it was like... It, 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 you know, you, you find yourself in these positions, you don't, you know, particularly kind of set off to... To, to, you know, you, you couldn't, you, you know, uh, it was like a combination of factors worked out in my favour. I was very fortunate. I was in the right clubs. I'd made the right decision to, to move towards mixing. I was doing something none of the other DJs were doing. I mean, they didn't have the equipment even to do that. So even if they had the music that I had, they couldn't compete against... The, the, the whole idea of mixing. At the same time as this, I'd been asked to go on the radio. I was doing Piccadilly Radio in Manchester, which was the biggest commercial station outside of London at the time. So it was like a, a big station. I was, I was putting these mixes together for them. It was a new idea. This was bringing what I was doing to like a wider audience again and bringing more people into it. And radio was still very powerful, right? Very powerful. These days. I mean, that was like the ambition of a DJ back then. You know, there was no superstar DJs and traveling the world. The ambition for most DJs, if you've made it, you've got on the radio, and that's, that's how, how it was seen, you know. Um, so these mixes that I were doing, like, were the first of the type in, 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 in the UK, and so it was, it was all new, you know, I mean, um, and then, you know, like, I was asked to demonstrate mixing on a TV program called The Tube in, in 1983, and that was the first time that had been shown, like, on the TV. Do At the remember? same time as all this, as well, is this music's coming through, so... It was a combination of factors that conspired to, you know, allow me to be in this position. But I was, don't get me wrong, I was always completely respectful to the position that I was in. And, I, you know, I, I always knew that, you know, it was like by the grace of the audience that I worked with that I was in. And I felt amazing being this young white guy from New Brighton that had grown up with a love of black music that all of a sudden was in this club with... with a, a really on the ball, hardcore black audience who knew their stuff, and you know that they accepted what I was playing. And, so skin you know, color was never a topic. Skin for color them wasn't with a you? topic from, from with regards from from black people to white. It was the other way around, and we were still in very racist times. And in, and you know to put things in a historical perspective, the year before all this happened was like 1981 when there were race riots right throughout the UK. In, in places like Brixton, Toxteth in Liverpool, Mossside in Manchester, Handsworth in Birmingham, St. Paul's in Bristol, you know. The, it, the generation of kids that were coming to the, these nights, the parents' generation had, 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 you know, they tried to toe the line, fit into what was going on, and they'd just been abused for, for that. But this generation of kids were different. They were like, we're here, we're staying here, you better get used to it, you know, and their attitude was different, you know, and, and, and it, you know, it, it was more confrontational. They weren't going to take that shit anymore, and quite rightly so. And, and that, that was like that whole generation. And they were, like, really given a bad time. There were, like, police laws at the time that allowed them to just stop people on the street for no reason and search them. And these laws were being used against young blacks. And, and the thing with, like, black culture at the time, a lot of, um, a lot of young black people smoked marijuana they didn't 
drink so much. There wasn't a drinks culture there. And so it was very easy to pick them up. And they were getting drugs records, you know, mm. just for having a little tiny bit on them. And, you know, there, there, was a lot, there was a lot of things that were wrong during that period of time that, um, you know, and a lot of things that people had to put up with. And that made it that these nights, for some people, that, that was the crux of everything, you know, for them. That was the time when they could forget about what was happening in the, in the whole day to day. And they were there, and, and the dancing and the music was important. They lived for night clubbing? Well, in, in a sense, yes. I mean, in, in a sense, it was a, a hugely important thing, you know. And the atmosphere in, in a club like Legend was like, it was intense, you know. It was serious. It was, it was amazing. I, I mean, I'll never, I'll never experience that again. Because the, the social conditions, you know, are different. Uh, and everything, the, t the time's different. It so was you would argue that dance music also has a political edge? Of course. I mean, all types of music, you know, have, you know, uh, I mean, it rises above that as well, you know. It, 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 but, but of course, you know, I mean, any, any, any kind of era of music is, is, is definitely, you know, like, involved Because with usually it's always described as a bit of a blunt thing, you know, just dance music being a bit stupid in general? Well, I mean, even back then, you know, like, that, that with the success that I had at Legend and Wigan Pier, a new club had opened in Manchester um, in May of 1982 called the Hacienda. And it, it had opened and it wasn't doing very well. It was, its audience were mainly white students who were into kind of Indian alternative music. They had a decent Saturday night but the rest of the time they were really struggling. And the club wouldn't have survived but for the fact that New Order, the band mm -hmm. New Order, who, um, they were directors of the club and they were plowing money into it. They had a vision though, I mean, they, they, they'd been over, the people from the Hacienda had been over to New York and they'd seen places like Paradise Garage, but even more importantly, a club called Van Soteria, which was like kind of mixing um, like the black side of that. Which was Arthur with, Baker's club, right? Dance no, no, no. no. Um, It, Dan, Dan Soteria was, uh, I don't know who, whose club it uh, was. John Jellybean, maybe? Benji? No, you're thinking of the Fun House. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the, the DJ at, um, at Dan Soteria was a guy called Mark Caymans, who worked mm. with Madonna early on. Um, I think Madonna did her first ever gig there, supporting a Manchester band called A Certain Ratio. Um, and so this Manchester connection with New York was there, like with the Hacienda, they'd seen this. And I think they wanted to bring a bit of, a bit of New York to Manchester. And they liked the idea of, of, of that kind of thing. And they, they realized what was happening down the road with, with the black scene. And, and they asked me to, to go across and work on, on the dance night there, which, which was the, the, we launched on the Friday night. Um, and it was a struggle, to be honest, because the, 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 the crowd that came to Legend, the black kids, you know, I mean, it, it, I think for a start, it was a membership club. You had to pay a membership to get in in the first place, which was a lot of money. And the kids that came to Legend didn't have money. Um, you know, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the time people say what drugs were used on the scene. People have a smoke, but you couldn't really do that within a club environment because it could be smelt. So, you know, people didn't want to get, like, thrown out of there because then they couldn't get back in. So they'd have to do it kind of either craftily in a corner somewhere or... So there wasn't, like, a major kind of drugs thing to it. Certainly not alcohol. People weren't drinking alcohol at all. A lot of the time, the kids only had enough money to kind of pay their admission in. And then they'd, they'd drink tap water. They'd get, like, a glass and they'd, they'd fill it with tap water. And the drug was, like, the music and the dancing. That was, you know... That, that, that. So something like the Hacienda was, like, set up in a totally different way. Um, that it, you know, like to, to even before you got in the club, you had to pay a ten pound membership or whatever it was, and like the New York thing. Yeah, like. and well, it was just Manchester licensing laws at the time. Legend had found a way of getting around it, um, but I mean, they they, uh, they for some reason hadn't, and and also the, the regular audience just didn't like dance music, and that's what we were saying, you know, about dance music. They looked on dance music as an inferior style. They thought bands and you know this was proper music and this dance stuff was somehow lower. In, in, in some respects, and so, you know, it was a real struggle to um, to get anything going at the Hacienda. We, we, we had some good nights, but they were kind of one-off nights, and then, they'd, you know, like, 
the, you know, I'd, I'd be doing the Fridays and they'd have a band booked in for the next Friday, so we'd have to miss a week and then kind of start again. And so it never really took off in the way that, you know, like we wanted it to, but a lot of seeds were planted during that period of time. And one of the main things that happened was that um, in the summer of 83, um, the, the whole kind of breakdance culture burst out of the black scene. Um, it, it, it had first like come through with Malcolm McLaren's Buffalo Gals video, which was like first shown on British TV at the back end of, um, uh, uh, sorry, at, at the beginning of 1983. Although I actually had a promo copy of the video that I played like back end of, of, of 82. And by this point, I'd now stopped doing the four nights a week residency at Wigan Pier, and I was completely a black music specialist. And I was now working also, I did a, a night in, in, in Huddersfield, because we, we used to have a strong kind of contingent come down from Huddersfield to the night, so I went and did a night there. And it was in this kind of run-down, ramshackle place called the Stars Bar, which was completely different to Wigan Pier and Legend, which were real state-of-the-art kind of clubs. And, but they had a video screen there, and I, and I took the video to Buffalo Gals, and I remember getting it through, I got sent it by the record company, and I looked at this video, and, and the, 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 the first thing that struck me, I mean, we now know there was four, like, four elements to hip hop, but, but at that time, rap was the only one that, that, that we'd heard you know, from, from our side. The other three were in there, which were graffiti, scratching, and of course, breakdancing. The funny thing was that the scratching, it was like world's famous Supreme Team on the video, and they were scratching, it was a seven inch single. And we'd heard the sound on records. And I, 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 re I remember thinking at the time, does it have to be a seven inch? Because he was using one of these seven inch singles. And, but the breakdancing did it, this guy spun on his head. And it, it, it was bizarre. It was like, it, it wouldn't have been more, more bizarre if a, if a Martian would have walked in and announced himself. It, the, the first time ever seeing that, and, I took this to the club, and this was like, um, you know, like clubs in the UK then stayed open until two o'clock. And at one o'clock, I, I thought, I'm going to play this video to the crowd. And, and Huddersfield, again, it was like a predominantly black audience, very hardcore crowd, you know, very raucous, rowdy crowd and everything. And I put this video on at one o'clock, and <clears throat> I understood at that point in time the meaning of the term culture shock because there was an absolute culture shock with, with, the, with the crowd. The, the, what they were watching, they, they couldn't properly take it in. And straight after I played it, they wanted it on again. And it was almost like I kind of became, you know, I picked up actually the microphone and I kind of became like, a, and I, can, well, could you sit down on the dance floor and let the people at the back watch as well? And everyone like sat down <laughs> and watched this video. For the last hour of the night, I just played this video. <laughs> there, was, there was no point in, in going back to a normal night because what people had seen had just like changed everything, you know. And, you know, they left at the end of the night. And this, this, and I mean, it was shown on TV the following month and, you know, then there were bits and bobs showing throughout. It wasn't like the next week everyone was breakdancing. It was a much slower process. People were at home practicing. They were in the kitchens on the lino. Bit by bit, they were getting the moves together. It didn't come out till the following summer. And the, the first it people- It takes some time to spin on your head. Well, they were just, I mean, you know, like speaking to some of the guys who did it, you know, they were saying that, you know, like what, one of the guys was telling me like that, that you know, the, the elbows were just bleeding with trying to get this move and, banging themselves and banging themselves, but kept going, kept going until they eventually got these moves together. And so it got to like the kind of early summer and it, firstly it was a crew from Huddersfield that they, it was in Wigan Pier, they were the first ones to show it in the club and at that very moment they showed it, this Manchester crew came in as well and they'd been doing it and it started. And then there was a crew called Broken Glass in Manchester that took to the streets and I got kind of heavily involved with them and ended up in a, like a managerial kind of role for them. They eventually, like, um, you know, did a lot of TV. Um, they were like, one of the guys was the first guy who was photographed, like, for a national publication, spinning on his head in the streets of Manchester. <laughs> Happened to be a guy called Kermit, who became one of my, my, still is one of my great friends. And Kermit was like a jazz fusion dancer. He'd started off in the jazz fusion crews. He was one of the early break dancers. Uh, later down the line, you know, he, he would, um, 
he, he would move on to become a rapper with a band called the rapper, Ruthless Rap Assassins that I managed. And further down the line, again, he'd hook up with Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays, and he'd be in a band called Black Grape, who had, like, a number one album. So Kermit comes from back in, in that time. Other people that come from that scene were, like, a guy called Gerald. He was, like, one of the kids that used to come along to Legend when he was 15. He used to put this big trench coat on and managed to look, like, older than he was and get in there. He started off as, like, kind of hip-hop DJ, also dancing and everything, you know. And it was, you know... the. the the, the, this kind of and he a lot did of people one... came through from this whole kind of scene, you know. That's uh, and, and the early this early kind of hip hop thing that, that came out of like the, the breakdance and the Buffalo Girls thing. Uh, it, it was it was fantastic. I mean, I, I just fell in love with the whole. That it was just so visual to watch, and, um, and and especially when it was out on the street. And one of the first things I did with Broken Glass was I arranged this um, this tour. It was called, I called it street tour, and all it was was going to like local shopping centres throughout the north of England, often we know where there were no black people, and there, so there's a crew of about kind of 15 black lads, because there was two white guys in Broken Glass, and there was about 16 black kids, you know, it was very much a black thing, from, and it was the same in London at Covent Garden, where it all kind of started down there. So the original kind of um, like b-boys, you know, like in Britain were, were obviously predominantly black kids that came from this scene. And so, you know, like going into an area where there, there was, you know, no black people at all, you know, I was very aware being white myself that, you know, of, of the kind of dynamics of what was going on. And very aware that, you know, like the local lads, if they saw a group of black kids, it looked like a gang, you know, coming into their area. That, it was a recipe for trouble, and it would have been if it would have been 12 months earlier. But all of a sudden, these kids like rolled out this lino, and they got out this ghetto blast, and they put on this music, and it was it was it was amazing. It must have done so much for race relations because all of a sudden, these young white kids who probably have never even spoken to a black person before were coming over and saying, "What is this? And what's this music and this dancing?" And there was this dialogue that was going on, and. You know, by the next summer, which was the summer of 80th floor, there were, there were break dancers all over the country, everywhere. And there was, lo obviously, it had come into, like, white culture, even, even into where he was, where there was no black culture, and it had kind of really permeated that. And you could see how the influence of it was going to spread out from there. And now, you know, in the UK, hip-hop culture is everywhere you look. Black culture is, you know... It, it, it's everywhere, you know, we don't notice it anymore, the way people dress, the way people talk, you know, it, it's just like right across the board. But at this particular point in time, it was like seeing it happening at its very root. And, you know, it was, it was a great time, you know, to, to, to actually to be out there on the street and see, see them down. And, and the joy that it brought, you know, and seeing like all the old people watching this and, you know, just being blown away by the whole thing. And so, but this is what happened with the Hacienda. On a Saturday night, which was their only half-decent night at the time... The indie night. Pardon? The indie night. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, it was a kind of mix, mishmash of these... The, the DJ was there, played everything from, you know, like rockabilly to dance music to punk to... You know, it was... Everything was kind of in there. But to try to get people into the idea of what I was doing on the Friday they got me in to do an hour on the Saturday. So I was playing mainly kind of electro-funk type stuff and the type of stuff that I would play at Legend. And as I say, the, the normal audience wasn't too into this kind of stuff. But Broken Glass had come and dance on the stage as I was playing. And so even though the people weren't into the music so much, the visual aspect of, of this, and they were, you know, everyone loved breakdancing, you know, when it first kind of started, because it, it just looked so fantastic. And um, it was the freshest thing about, you know. And, and so they became like kind of celebrities at the Hacienda. They almost became like the Hacienda's like kind of resident dance crew. And I think that, you know, their presence there gave the club for the first time a credibility with a street credibility with like the kind of black audience that it had never had before. And as time would move down the line the next few years and it would, you know, move towards what we all know now as that kind of summer of love 88, so we still got like a kind of five year gap, that more and more black kids started to come into the Hacienda and the original, the original house crowd, and, and again this isn't really well documented at all, 
in Manchester was a black crowd that were going to the same kind of clubs that played electro. And this is after I, I stopped DJing at the end of 83, but... Why? Did why? You? Right, breakdancing had something to do with it. Right, the clubs that I played in, all of a sudden, you know, the whole breakdancing thing had exploded, which at first was fantastic, but pretty soon, some of the people were fed up that whenever anything remotely electro was played, there was like a ruck of people around the dance floor watching a challenge going on between, and, and especially the girls, you know, all of a sudden there was no dancing space. It become a, a, quite a macho kind of situation. And, you know, and so it, I could see that there was a split going to happen there. That, you know, um, it was the start of the hip hop, the kind of hip hop scene emerging on one side. And I think that from the other side, there was almost like initially a bit of a retrospective step where a lot of people got into a more kind of, a lot of the soul stuff that was like street soul that was out at the time. And eventually the house thing came through and moved on to that. Although there was never, and that's an important thing about that time, there was never a separation within music. All the, you know, all the, the best black music was played on the same nights. You know, it was like, Everything that when I was playing electric, I was still playing jazz, you know, doing jazz breaks here and there. Still playing like the kind of disco boogie type tracks and the funk tracks and some of the more soulful things. And it was all played within the context of one night. The tempos ranged from downbeat to up tempo and every mood in between, and that was how things worked. And so, you know, there was never a, a direct separation, although there was more of an emphasis on one thing between certain clubs. One and club would have more of an emphasis on a jazz thing, one would have more of an emphasis on an electro type side, but they'd still overlap in some of the stuff that they played. And the opposite happened with the emerge of house music then? Well, house, when the first house tracks came through, um, you know, like kind of tracks and DJ international things, they were played in the same clubs that were playing electro. And then, you know, like there were kind of the, the freestyle thing had started, the Miami bass thing had started. You know, there was all these little <laughs> strands of things. And this was just another aspect of it when it started. Mm. It was just another new kind of electronic based music that, that fit into this vibe. And, and so, you know, like before the Hacienda took off as a house venue, there were places like, uh, the Playpen, Berlin, the Gallery, these were all Manchester clubs, Legend, obviously, how it continued on after I'd gone. All these clubs were playing at the early house tunes and, and, and the crowd that were first into it. I mean, this is like documentary from the Hacienda side, Mike Pickering and uh, also uh, Laurent Garnier, who was DJ um, at the Hacienda before the kind of rave scene. He's been, um, you know, documented to say that, I mean, it's quite interesting from his perspective because he worked at the Hacienda before it all exploded and the, the kind of rave era started. Um, he was in Manchester, I think he came to Manchester as a chef or something, yeah. and he'd ended up DJing there. And he'd had to go back to France to do national service. And when he came back, all the rave thing had happened. So he saw it before and then he came afterwards. And what he said was before he went, the house crowd was mainly black crowd. When he came back, it was mainly white crowd. And, which is, is obvious, really, because the black kids were always into dance music anyway. They were always serious about it. They were serious about the dancing. Then, all of a sudden, this little pill came along. <laughs> and loads of people who, six months previously, would have told you dance music was the biggest load of shit there was. Took a little pill. And it changed it and all. And then they were like that, and they were doing all, you know. And, uh, and so, from, from the perspective of the black kids, it was like their scene had been invaded. And they moved on from that, and they set up new scenes, and a new kind of evolution of, of, from that side came that, that originally would have been like kind of coming from hardcore into jung jungle, into drum and bass, into UK garage, into like broken beat, you know, and, and taking on that kind of level. Whereas the house scene kind of evolved in a different way, and um, you know, which we know about because obviously the documentation of that, you know, has been done. But you know, like this this period that we're talking about this in-between period, you know, like, for a long time, it was left out of the equation. From my own perspective, I'd stopped DJing. The reason I stopped DJing, as I said, the breakdancing was a part of it. Another thing that, that was the reason I stopped DJing was I wanted to get into remixing, because by doing the mixes for radio, initially I was doing them like normal mixes, you know, uh, they'd come down from the radio station with a reel-to-reel -reel machine and take me doing a mix as I would do in a club. 
But, um, you know, then they go back and top and tail it. You know, they put leader tape on and finishing tape. And if, you know, you wanted to kind of do, oh, I'll, I'll just do that again, they'd run an edit. And then one day we went back and there was no one to do the edit because they had never tape up. And I'd been shown, like, Years before, I'd made a demo tape for radio, and somebody had shown me about How to editing. Use. And back then, like, if you made a demonstration tape for radio, it was all about your voice, so you didn't want to give them a half-hour tape with like, loads of music on, because they didn't want to hear that. They just want to hear your, your presentation style. So you edited out the track. So you just had the intro of the track, you edited it to the end of the track, and then it carried on from there. It also had to be on real, so really you couldn't give a radio station a cassette because that would have been seen as amateurish and mm. they wouldn't even listen to it. So it had to be presented in a certain way with green tape at the beginning and red tape at the end. And, and so he showed me this back then and I kind of remembered. And then this day, there was no one at the radio station to, um, to, to, to edit this for me. And I was in my own in the station. I went into one of the editing booths and the next thing I'm turning tape round and I'm like running little effects and just really getting into it. And, you know, I mean, so you had to use a razor blade. Yourself? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, my love affair with editing like just started there. I, I, I just loved it. You know, I mean, the idea of cutting tape and, you know, as as it evolved down the line, you know, I just get more and more intricate. So the a mix was eventually taking me like you know best part of a day to do, because I, I, I was doing all these little things, editing bits out, putting bits in, you know. Further down the line, it, it got like, you know, got even more into it. I'd even like do things like, um, I'd edit, I'd, I'd measure a beat, literally measure it with a ruler. And then I'd half a beat and a quarter a beat and I'd eighth a beat and I'd cut loads up and I'd have about 30 bits of tape there and there and it'd have little marks on and I knew what was what and then I'd put them back together and it was just like, no one, sh no one showed me how to do that. I just kind of evolved like these, this madcap scheme of like, putting my kind of things together, but I, I just like really got into it and, I, and that slowed the process down for me from it being like a live medium of mixing. It was all of a sudden it was kind of working much more slowly with music and that kind of led towards wanting to get involved in, in like remixing. And I knew all the people from the record companies anyway, you know, because I've known them for years. They always got sent record, British record, even though I was, you know, by this point, I was rarely playing any British records. Everything was like American import stuff that I was playing. And I was saying to them, you know, I want to do some remixing. And they were saying, yeah, but American DJs remix. English DJs don't remix. And it was, it's bizarre now, like, thinking about it. And I couldn't get, you know, and I was really, really eager to do something and just give me a chance. And they couldn't, like, get their bosses to, you know, let me loose on the multi-track tape, you know. And, and do a mix. They just didn't trust, like, you know, they were sending the, the stuff off to the States. And, and so, eventually I hooked up with these two musicians from Manchester, one who was in a, a band, a kind of post-punk band called Magazine, one who was in a certain ratio, and we started doing tracks together. And that, that became, you know, uh, UK Electro. There was, like, a series of albums in the UK, very influential, called um, Street Sounds Electro that a guy called Morgan Kahn put together, which was really what brought electro to the more mainstream. It kind of happened, if you take into account Planet Rock was May 82, and the first Street Sounds electro album was October of 83, there was quite a gap in between. Mm. But these albums, you know, they were, they, these were entering the charts, and also they were, the, I, th I think they were, they were like the first series of albums that were mixed. They were mixed by some guys in London called Mastermind, Mastermind Roadshow. And for most young break crews that were starting then, this was, they, they probably sold more on cassette than they did on vinyl. <laughs> um, because they were like get a blaster kind of for the break dancers. Because again, that's another point that, you know, from a British perspective, the original break dancers didn't dance to breaks and 70s funk and, you know, the stuff Cool Hurt played. They danced to electro, you know, because that was the first music when they started getting yeah, into yeah. it. So these electro albums were like, like really, really kind of important. Um, and we went to see more, well, I went to see Morgan Khan because I knew him with a couple of these tracks and he came up with this idea um, of doing a compilation, even though it was the same people who'd done all these tracks, he named made up there was like four or five different acts, like there was this thriving electro scene, but apart from one of the tracks on the album, they were all up, me and these two guys putting it together. And, um, and so... So what was your project name then for, for that? Well, there wasn't really. It was like, um, 
the, the, well, the, the names he gave it, I mean, we have Broken Glass, the breakdancers. We did a track with them, with Kermit rapping. It was the first track he rapped on. Um, and that was called Style of the Street. There was sync beats with music, which was probably the, 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 the track out of that that was like um, the best received track. There was a, a, two of the tracks were by uh, Forever Reaction and two of the tracks were by Zero. But as I say, they're all the same people. It was just us experimenting, making it up as we went along, doing our own slant on electro. It wasn't so much like the, <coughs> the New York stuff that I was playing. It was, it was this hodgepodge, you know. I mean, now it's become kind of a cult album, you know. And, um, but, but back then, we did well. We got to number 60 on the British chart with it. It all looked good for a time. And I'd stopped DJing now to concentrate on doing all this. And, uh, and then it all went wrong. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, everything why? went Persian. I don't know. It just like, it imploded, you know. And I, I found myself in a situation where I was no longer a DJ. Um, I had no money. Um, there was no money coming in. My, my car went. <laughs> The next thing, my house went, you know, and I didn't want to go back. You know, I, I couldn't go back at that point. I didn't have the heart to go back. And I mean, although I, I wouldn't have identified it as a reason at the time, now with hindsight I can see, I'd been DJing since I was 15. I'd done it solidly for eight years. And as I say, it wasn't like, say, now where maybe DJs sometimes, you know, work three or four nights a month or something. It was, you know average of five and six nights a week uh, throughout that period of time. I hadn't had like a normal teenage life. You know, I was doing this when I was still at school. I was falling asleep in class because I was out in the clubs the night before, you know. I messed my exams up because I wasn't turning up because I was DJing and, you know, it, I lived the whole thing. It was everything to me. And I needed, I suppose I needed to find myself to get away from it. And when I did come away from it, you know, it really freed me up. I started listening to all sorts of different music in a new way. I didn't have to listen to it just thinking about the dance floor. Mm. It was like pure, you know, and I started reading and, you know, looking at life. And I mean, uh, you know, I've got to admit that another reason, like with regards to the decision that I made, um, was hanging around with like a lot of black kids. I started smoking a lot of drugs. And that changed my way of looking at life in a big way. That really, I mean, you know, it, it's very much an opener, you know. And my perspective changed. I saw things in a completely different way. And, um, and, and you know, that, that, that had a big, made a big impression and an impact on me um, in both a positive and ultimately in, in negative ways, you know. It's two-sided to everything, you know, like, um, and so, you know, that coming away from it, I was like looking at things in a completely different way. I mean, what was really strange is that after being into this like cutting edge American music, <clears throat> black music coming from America, the, the next big thing I got into after I stopped DJing, and when I say got into, I mean obsessively got into, like ridic to a ridiculous level, was the, was the Beatles. <laughs> and that was in the mid, the mid 80s at a time when <laughs> there hadn't been Oasis kind of bringing it up. You know, like, people used to think, gee, it's a real quirk. I mean, later down the line, when I managed to rap assassins, who were like three black guys from Manchester, you know, people come to the office, and it's a ruthless rap assassins. There'd be like Beatles 1965 poster in there. <laughs> people can quite work it out. And they thought it was quite a quirky thing at the time. But it was a great thing as well, because what it did, I mean, you know, I got into it because, you know, I'd always liked the music since I was a kid, you know, and... and it was the time, you know, to sit down and listen, and um, I listened to everything that they had ever done, and then started reading the books. And I must have read in a period of three or four years over a hundred books that was about or related to. And it's not just the ab Beatles. about the Beatles, yes. <laughs> and I lived in Liverpool as well, so I had a perspective on them as people, because I knew where they came from, I knew the places that they were talking about. I knew what a cultural thing it was, how much it affected everything. And the thing with the Beatles is, as a starting point, it takes you everywhere. Because they were obviously majorly influenced by, uh, you know, R&B. <laughs> yeah. So you learn about that. There was the whole psychedelic era that they went through. You go into that, you get into, you know, you get into the whole kind of history of popular culture. And it, it gave me a, an overview and a grounding and um, to see the bigger picture and to understand 
an awful lot more about, you know, the things that I was into anyway. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's funny, I can remember at the time saying, you know, like, um, they should teach this in school. <laughs> and they are now. They're actually starting to teach these things in school to kids. The, the, you know, the, the, and because it is, it's our history, it's like, it's, it's like the whole post-war kind of history that, um, you know, that, that, that we're a part of, that we, we, we grew up in. And, and they're such a symbol of that because they take you before it and they take you after it. You know, you've got to, if you want to learn about the history of popular music, you've got to go through the Beatles. There's no option because, they, you know, so many first things happened. You know, the whole, the industry, a lot of, you know, like the inventions within the music industry was because people trying to catch up with what was happening with this phenomenal thing of these four lads, you know, it just happened and, you know, and so, you know, e even down to a level, I mean, I, I, I never realised until I got into all this that something like the, the, the word teenager didn't exist before the early 50s. There was no such thing as a teenager. It was like a marketing invention. It was to do or with... Rock and roll? Or? Well, it, well, it was to do with the idea that, you know, like before, say before the Second World War, there was, there was young people and adults. And so, you know, if you were like a, a boy, for example, you, would, you were like a young man and then you were a man. There was nothing in between, you know. Um, it was done, it, the idea of the teenager arose after the war in America. There was like money being spent within a certain sector you know, uh, which was like that kind of age group between, you know, like the kind of 13 to 18 age group. And I think it was done in an advert. I think the first time it, it was used was, uh, there was an advert which said, this is the teen age. And the word caught on from that. And so... These days you can be a teenager until you are way past 40. Is right? that right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, you know, I mean, so... Just getting, a, you know, like, as I say, getting a kind of bearing on that, that came later, and probably a lot had to do with the copious amounts of, you know, hashish and marijuana that I was smoking <laughs> at the time, uh, which ultimately had a negative effect because... It was too much? Well, it just slows you down if, you, if you, you know, doing it every day, which is what I did for, like, 20 years, you know. And, you know, like, the first thing, you know, there was, I used to smoke cigarettes and... and, and I decided about, you know, uh, early 90s, I'm going to pack in smoking cigarettes, but what I meant was that I'm just going to smoke joints. So all of a sudden then I was just smoking joints from like the first thing I got, got up in the morning. So I didn't smoke a cigarette as such, but I was still smoking tobacco. It's just like a false dawn, you know. And, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I stopped eventually. I, I you got rid of the habit? But you got rid, I got of, rid the... of the tobacco. Let's oh. put it that way. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and what prompted you to get back into DJing then right. eventually? Well, during the 90s, I, I just felt lost. I felt, I felt older then than, than I do now because a lot of things were changing. I think, like, what, what occurred to me was that once the house thing started, which was fantastic, you know, the original house explosion was amazing. And if you go back to somewhere like the Hacienda in those kind of, you know, the 88 period, it wasn't just house music being played. It, they were still playing hip-hop and stuff, and it was a bit like, you know, it was, it was still derivative of the way the black scene had been before that, where all these different types of music went into the melting pot. And making down-tempo breaks. Exactly, you know, it, it was all within there. But then it started all to narrow in. And it was one style, and it was just these four beats that just took over completely. And, and me watching from the outside, I couldn't quite understand, you know. I mean, I remember speaking to somebody, um, a DJ at that time, and I, it was about a, there was a, a certain down-tempo track, and I asked them if they, if they played, and they said, no, they can't, it's too slow. And I just remember thinking, God, it's wiping out a whole area. And also, you know, I mean, remember for Impact, it, it used to always be great, you know, you're playing something quite up-tempo, and then drop it right down to something slower and it kind of went into a groove and that was like you know always like a real impact moment and all that had kind of gone and it had just got into first first it just got into the, the straight 4-4-B then it kind of closed in even more that one day you know it, it was all of a sudden that there were all sorts of different types of house now and everything was subdividing and so Somebody played it happy and somebody played it dark and it was like all that was there before and 
it was, you know, th those, all those moods were played together, but now everything was separating up. Obviously, the reason being was like the drug, the, the influence of the drug, and I think really in, in many respects is the music was no longer leading, the drug was leading the music as opposed to the opposite way around as it had been in the first place. And so from my point of view, the 90s, I, I couldn't quite understand, I couldn't grasp what was happening. It was, it was alien to me to see the way that everything was going. Um, I was also at the time, you know, I mean, there, there were times when I was really struggling financially on a personal level, and my friends could see this and were saying to me, get back into DJing, you can make money, people are making big money out of DJing, trade on your reputation, your past, you'll do all right. And it sounded great to the point where they went, all you've got to do is work out what style of house you've got to play. <laughs> and I'd be like, but I don't want to, I, I, I don't, I, I, there's some stuff I like, but I like that and I like this and you, and you can't do that. You've got to, and I, I couldn't do it. I'm so glad I didn't do it, you know, because it would have been soul destroying for me and it would have felt on a personal level that, you know, it was against everything that I believed in. So I just kind of carried on. I mean, I was always involved in music and projects, and, you know, like, Rap Assassins was a great time, did two albums, free MI, but it was a kind of up and down life, and sometimes things were going well, sometimes things were really hard. And that was, like, the world that I was kind of involved in, and smoking too much dope in the meantime. And so, you know, it was, it was this kind of, you know, just living by my wits in many respects. But... Uh, you know, I was still walking into studios with my reel-to-reel, -reel, and everyone else was using, like, kind of computers, and, you know, this, I looked like this DJ Fossil come back in and <laughs> put me reel-to-reel -reel out. And, and even though, like, you know, I was using it on a kind of really productive level, I'd made all these tapes of sounds, and as I, as I worked with the track, I'd be spinning sounds over the top of the track and adding textures to it. And I still do that now from a DJing perspective. I brought the reel-to-reel -reel back into that. But are you using it for edits still? These no, days? because there's no point with the computers. I mean, but I was, I was a real technophobe at the time. I just, I, 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 I was just scared of the technology. I just thought, you know, I don't know how to do this and everything. And, you know, I felt that I was kind of slipping back more and more. And it's like younger people were coming along who it was second nature for them to. I was just feeling out of touch. And, and you know, I was kind of, there, there were certain points that I just thought to myself, what happened, I was doing all right at one point, and I, I completely lost, you know, the plot somewhere, and I, you know, I've lost my way, and, and it, you know, it was like, where did it all go wrong, and, and this kind of thing. But then, you know, I mean, I eventually made the decision that I've got to kind of get involved in the modern age, you know. I'm, I'm, a friend of mine was working in radio production at the time, and he had an editing system called Sadie, which is like a kind of professional radio editing system, and I learned how to use that. And somebody had said something to me at the time when I was saying, yeah, but you know, like all these, you look all these younger people coming along and they, they you know, they've, the skills that they've got, and they, you know, and they, and they said, yeah, but they haven't got your experience. And I kind of thought, mm, yeah, you know, there's something to that. And when I, you know, started getting involved, of course, I knew all about editing. So, you know, but it's second nature, the mathematics of editing. It's in my brain, I think, in bars, and I see it. So somebody might be able to learn a program of editing, but then they've got to learn how to edit. So, you know? what, what, makes, so what makes a good edit? Pardon? What makes a good edit? Well, I think it's, it's, you know, it's different for every, everything. To, to, to know when to stop is, is, <laughs> is possibly one thing. You know, to certain things, it only needs a couple of a couple of touches, other things you can go much deeper into, everything at its own, you know, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, I only edit for what, you know, I only edit for what I feel, what I like, you know, so I think it's, it's a subjective thing as well, you know, it's, do what you, you know, I mean, if someone wants to edit, great, you know, do what you want to do, if you, if you, if there's a track and you feel that there's part of it you want to take out, take it out, you know. It's what, it's what you get off on, you know. So maybe you can... Or, or to extend one. something for the dance floor or something. You want me to play an edit? Yeah, one of your... Right. Uh, yours, that you would say... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll play something that, that's... Um, this is before I started DJing again. I actually put this out as a, a record um, last year did really well on an underground level. It kind of sold, eh, you know, all over the place. I went to New York last year and all the DJs there had it on, the, like the underground guys, and it was like, wow, that's, you know, it's great. But I'd done this at home. I mean, 
what, what I did was, once I'd made this move, um, and I was getting him, you know, I wanted to kind of work the computer and everything. Um, I'm not the kind of person who you can explain, um, this is how it all works and take it in that way or read a manual. It, it, you know, I need to know what I want to do and then have that explained step by step, then I can do it. And so, to, to, to kind of get myself used to it, I made what these sketches, uh, you know, I, I saw them as sketches and they were just like, everything was loop based in what I did. I mean, the, the, the main program, the program got, in fact, this friend who, 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 who um, had the Sadie Edison system, he said to me, um, that he said, I've seen this program. He didn't say, I've seen this program you like. He said, I've seen this program that is you. <laughs> and I was like, right. And, and it was a program called Acid. Don't know if anyone's used it. And it is me. It's like, it's a loops based system. Perfect. E exactly, you know, where I'm coming from. I'm not a musician. I'm very much editing based. I can work with musicians and, and stuff, but you know, this allowed me to sit on my own for the first time and make my own tracks. Whereas before I'd needed a singer or I'd needed to work with a musician or an engineer to help me, you know, but now I could do it. And this is one of the things that I, I, I came up with and it's called, well, I called it I Was a Teenage DJ. Thank you. I did like all these sketches and I mean there's like loads ended up about 30 of them and they're all you know loop spaced and it was really freeing because I felt for the first time that it didn't matter what anybody else thought of them this is what I was into because I'd chosen all the sections they were my you know it's my choice it's the stuff I'm into that's why I chose the loops in the first place so it's great. If people like it, that's fantastic because we all, we've got our own egos and we like people to like what we're doing and stuff. But ultimately, it was, it was almost kind of therapeutic. It was by me, for me. And, you know, I chose that title. That I was a teenage DJ. So you would recommend? From, because it, it linked back into that kind of... I mean, it was funny because when I was doing it, I, I, most people would have thought I would have gone back to the electro period that I was involved in. But I kind of went back to an earlier time. I went back almost to when I started to try and a kind of reconnection with that so I was doing I was doing that and doing these tracks I was getting involved I was also the internet the internet started kind of going on there um, my eyes were opening up to that and seeing things on the internet and coming across different sites and it just became apparent to me reading about well I mean now a, a long period has elapsed since you know um, the whole kind of dance culture thing exploded. So people are documenting it in a historic sense. They're talking, you know, they're putting all this back together. And I could see that there was this huge missing chunk from the UK perspective. And the missing chunk basically was the black scene. It was missing. People, people are even trying to connect Northern Soul to house, house directly. And here's the scene that the great club of Northern Soul was Wigan Casino, which had burned down in 1981, when I was working down the road at Wigan Pier, the same night as that, which was a completely different thing. And so it's almost the old and the new. And the, the Hacienda kind of explosion, we're talking about 88. The seven years, that's a very big period of time. Yet people, I was hearing documentaries on BBC radio and people were saying, oh yeah, you know, like, the, 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 the house scene in Manchester became because people were used to dancing the, to the up-tempo -temp rhythms of Northern Soul, and it's like, total bollocks. It's, <laughs> it's, it's totally untrue. The, the house scene evolved in Manchester because the black kids got on the music, and we're into it, you know, like, from the off, and eventually that crossed over so that the more mainstream audience came into it. And there was, you know, it was like this kind of early 80s period, the electro-funk period, was completely missing from a lot of people's um, knowledge about, about and I, I kind of realised what had happened was that a lot of the people who were writing about house culture and rave culture had got into it, they might have thought they got into it early, they might have thought I got into it in 86, 87, and thought that was early. But in the real sense of the term, that's it's still very late in the day. I mean, we're talking about a culture of dance music in the UK that dates back to the 60s with R&B. 
and goes right through the 70s with the whole funk and disco thing and goes into the early 80s with, you know, like the jazz funk and the electro funk era into the early house, into the early techno, into the start of the hip hop scene before we get to this rave explosion. And so, you know, I thought, well, you know, you can kind of moan about this, you know, you know, they've got it wrong and everything, <laughs> or you can, you can contribute to it. And I had upstairs in, in my loft all my archive material from back in the early 80s. So I thought, well, yeah, I can put together a website that's based specifically around that early 80s period, but can also take you back to a previous period. And, you know, can. And I came up with the idea of like doing a website, Electro Funk Roots, and put that website up. And once I'd done that, then, then people started getting in touch with me and saying, you know, would you DJ? And it became uh, viable for me to do because what I didn't want to be, be doing, I didn't want to be Mr. Retro coming back, playing the music I used to play then in exactly the same way as I used to play it. That's fine now and again. Uh, as a nostalgic thing, uh, you know, I've got no problem uh, on one-offs, but to come back to DJing purely based on that was, was not what I wanted to do. Although at the same time, obviously I want to draw from that period, and also the period before that, the 70s period, the, you know. And what, what are the new thing, things you're into? Well, what allowed it to have a contemporary thing, which is what I needed before I felt I could go back into it and, and be doing it in the way that, you know, that I wanted to. Um, the edits made a big difference. Because I didn't know about re-editing. I was so out of touch with the scene in the 90s. I just stopped going to clubs and everything. I didn't know people were doing re-edits. And, you know, I'd been doing them, like, back in, you know, kind of 84, 83 and stuff, you know, with these radio mixes. I'd sort of doing things like that. Didn't even call them re-edits at the time. They were just... I actually called them turntable edits because I recorded the tracks off turntables and then edited them up and made something different. And so, you know, editing, yeah, of course, that's what I do, you know, and so... I, it allowed me then I could edit certain tracks up to play, you know, like when I was out, you know, brought them into a more contemporary side. And there was also, what, what I hadn't uh, realized was that there was already a movement in thought back to this period of time anyway. The, the way I see it is the cycle had come to a certain point whereby this house era, it was a incredible period of time, you know, for one style of music to have such a dominance um, from that kind of late 80s into, you know, into the new millennium, you know, like the, you know, like the, the mainstream of clubs was still kind of on this four on the floor beat. And I just think that a generation of people began to start to look for something else and couldn't necessarily find, you know, a new thing to move on to necessarily, unless they were into a certain scene like, you know, like Broken Beat scene and from the drum and bass side and everything. But, for, you know, there, there wasn't really a, a kind of step off towards, you know, a new scene from house so much. And I think quite a few people started looking back towards disco at that point in time and starting to make those connections and, and started to get into that music. And, and what they'd heard about disco had been all the negative side of it, it had been John Travolta in the white suit with his hand in the air and the Bee Gees and, and everything that was later, everything that kind of changed disco from being originally what I said it was, it was music that was played in discotheques, generally soul and funk, to be in this image of platform shoes and, you know, a very kind of tacky, you know, aspect of it that people, so it was almost like, mm, disco was like, but now people were realizing, God, you know, the musicians that played on a lot of this stuff are just, like, amazing, you know, and realising what actually happened. And I think some people also kind of found their way to the early 80s and the fusion, the kind of hybrid, the idea that disco was supposedly at that point, you know, from an American perspective, it died, you know, they'd, they'd, like, done with it, it was the old thing, but all it had done is gone back underground redefining itself, new ideas, as I say, the Jamaican dub aspect, all the remixes like T. Scott, Larry Levan, Kevorkian, Shep Pettibone, Tony Humphreys, you know, the hip-hop flavour coming into it, Grandmaster Flash and, you know, like people like Steinsky and Double D doing their things, all these experimental things that, that forged what was going to happen after that. The music changing, the instrumentation that was being used, the technology coming into it, 
the new, you know, aspects of house and techno and, and the, the, the fact that hip hop had been brought through via, you know, like this, this period of time. And, and people, I don't think, you know, generally, and still a lot of people today don't realize this. They still think, you know, from a UK perspective, that a group of DJs went to Ibiza in 1987 <laughs> and brought back dance music, and that's when it started. And, but now people are starting to realize the true roots of what, what went on, which I think is really important because if you don't know the roots of something, I don't think you can move forward properly. If your roots are wrong, it's hard to, but if you can go back to that. And with everything that I'm, I'm kind of involved in now and what I'm doing, the way that I look on it, it doesn't mean much if it becomes just purely going back and looking at nostalgia. That's great to its own thing, but what's really important is where it goes from here. That a younger generation takes this and runs with it and does their thing with it and reinterprets it and brings that and uses that as an ideas pad and for their influences and what happens from here. And that's happening now, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people making a new style of underground dance music that's for instance, derivative. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, for example, like on the credits of the Edit album that I put together, like Chicken Lips was a perfect example of that. You know, I used one of their tracks on there. And that was like really strange because before I kind of got back into the DJing again, there was a record shop in Liverpool called 3B. And I was, had a bit of business there with the guy who owned the shop. And I went into the office and there was, uh, the manager of the shop was a guy called Pez. And, and he, the, he was introduced to me and he said, are you the same Greg Wilson that used to be a DJ? And I was like, yeah. And he said, I've got this tape. He said, can I bring the tape in? I, and he was going on about this tape. I've got, can you identify some of the tracks? It's, it's one of your mixes. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And every time I'd see him, he'd say to me, um, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to get this tape back off my mate. And, you know, like, okay, you know. And then all of a sudden, he sent through the post two CDs, and it was either side of the tape on the CDs, plus a couple of albums by a band called Chicken Lips. First time I'd come across them. And then it, it materialized what had happened that when he was a kid, uh, he'd like, you know, been influenced by the breakdancing thing along with his mates, who was Dean Meredith, who now turns out to be in this band Chicken Lips. And they'd come across this tape and the tape had come from a friend of theirs and the friend had a sister and the sister had a boyfriend and the boyfriend went <laughs> to the club and the club was legend. And he got this tape and they managed to make a copy of the tape and they'd had the tape all these years and they didn't know what the tracks were. They knew it was on the radio and they knew that this name Greg Wilson was involved with it, but they didn't know what the tracks were. And they found some of the tracks along the way and they'd made it a personal mission to try and find as many of these tracks as possible. And the weird thing was it turned out that this tape was the first two mixes I'd ever done on the radio. And so I was able to tell him what these, these tracks were and it turned out that in the meantime, Dean Meredith, had, um, he'd gone on to um, form the band Bizarre Inc. And they'd been a huge band during the rave period. Playing with knives. Playing with knives, yes, and everything. So he'd gone through that. Then he'd had a band called uh, Psychedelia Smith that was signed to Norman Cook's label. And, you know, then he got to a loose end. Where am I going from here? And he dug out this tape again. And the kind of stuff that was on this tape was like things like emergency and prelude tracks and West End tracks and those things, you know, those kind of early electro funk tracks. And he basically decided to take that direction, to take the Im influence of that tape and make a new thing from it. And it had come round full circle. And so it was obvious to me that when I was doing the credits of the edit album to bring it full circle from my own side to use the Chicken Lips track. Do you have it with you? Uh, I should do somewhere. Um, where did I put it? Yeah. This is a track called He Not In. It, it was like you know, like the kind of main tempo around that period was about 120 BPM, you know. Um, a few years later, people thought that was slow, you know. They were like just getting 
faster and faster. That was like the, the progression that they saw was just to make it faster. I mean, even earlier than that, you know, I mean, some of those kind of early house tracks like, um, you know, for example, a track like uh, this Brutal House, Nitro Deluxe, is, I think it's about 114 BPM. Mm. And, and very derivative of electro. You can see the, the linkage, you know, perfectly within, within something like that. But as I say, you know, that kind of tempo of music was, was almost like wiped out and it had to be faster. It got to a point where, you know, if it wasn't faster than 130 BPM, it, it couldn't be played in the club for some reason. So I think some people have found the way back to that just by, you know, by accident in a sense, whereas other people, are, are, are like Chicken Lips, have listened back to that period and rediscovered it and, you know, listened to the music of that and, and let that influence what they're doing um, now, you know, and, and taking it forward from that. So, see, the theory that I have on it as well is that it was such a melting pot period of ideas. It was, it was so open and experimental in what people were doing. I mean, literally, I was going in the record shop every week and being blown away by hearing just really new stuff that I'd never heard before. And I mean, two or three tracks, you know, like it was, the, it was coming thick and fast, you know, like for about an 18 month period, it was like intense, you know, like the creativity and the music that was happening. And if you say that, you know, like things like house and techno, uh, like evolved from that, it could have been other things that came from that. There could have been other directions that were taken. It just happens that those were the directions that it went in. And I think now people are kind of going back and saying, oh, right, it can go here as well, or it can go in this place too. And so it's still as, you know, it, it's a crossroads. It's, it's, it's the moment in time in dance music where it changed from the old style of dance music, which was basically music made by live musicians, to the new style of dance music, which was music made by technology. And it was like the crossroads period. And what was like an, an interesting discovery for me, and I think that links in with where, if somebody was saying, where can it go to from here? And the one thing that I got it down to was when I started listening back to a lot of these records, these same records I used to play back then. When I first heard them, I was listening to the technological aspect of these, these records because it was the new thing about them. But when I went back to them, I'd go, God, I, I didn't realize that I'd like live percussion, or I, I, I didn't know that I had, a, I had a bass on it or a guitar. And then you start realizing there's a fusion going on here. There's a fusion of live instrumentation and technology. And technology, you were just hearing it from, in, in certain cases, from the technological side, because at the time, as I say, that was like, that was the newness of it. But going back to it, you're hearing it in a different way. And almost now I feel like it can go full cycle again, in so much that what might have been lost from, from dance music in, in a certain respect, it's great that people were able to start putting dance music together themselves, at home, in computers and stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for, for, for that kind of aspect. But you can't beat a live musician. You can't beat a, a true musician. You, you know, th that's a special thing. That's a, a skill. So the idea of, like, you know, now bringing a more musical aspect back into the technology, you know, I, I see that definitely as, 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 as a, a way forward. And, I mean... You know, I hear that in certain things that, you know, that even the people that were programming the music back then were generally musicians. It was like, you know, like the people who were programming the drum machines were in, in many cases drummers, you know, like the, who, who were forward minded enough to think, you know, like, uh, let's try this out and, and work on that level. So the, it, the realization that there was like, um, a very high standard of musicianship going on within these tracks, even though they seemed, you know, like at the time... Computer music. Compu I mean, again, you know, like going back to the people that were the, the purists at the time who were against this, I think they literally believed that the music made itself in some sort of way. How that changed, actually, was a few key tracks came out during that period that made them change their mind. One of them was Marvin Gaye did Sexual Healing. Marvin Gaye, one of the greatest soul artists well, ever, you know, one of the, you know, the titans was using a drum machine. 
And I think that, you know, made a lot of people have to think of it in a different way. Herbie Hancock doing Rocket, Herbie Hancock was like a jazz musician. Now he was totally embracing the technology. He was, I think he said in an interview one time, you know, somebody's got to put the plug in. Somebody's got to, you know. The, 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 but people were naive enough then to think that it was like somehow it made itself. You know, it, it's like in any form of music, in whatever way you make it, you know, you've got to give a bit of yourself and, and you know, nothing comes, even the most simplistic music, you know, the beauty in it is its simplicity, you know. So, um, but I think it got to maybe, a st you know, a, a stage with dance music as we know it, whereby the musical aspect became less and less important. And I, I think, that, you know, that it needs a renaissance in that, in a sense, that, you know, that I can see more of a fusion. I can see people working with, with musicians, bringing live musicians in, working alongside the technology and creating from that, which is, as I say, is, is kind of going back to, it's like one of those directions that we were talking about before that could, it could have gone in that, you know, that way mm. that hasn't been discovered. I'm really excited about music now. I think that we're, we are back at a similar point in time, it is a crossroads period again. And, you know, that's always a, a, an exciting point. I mean, a lot of people, for example, in the UK, the, the, mag the, the new music paper, the NME, a couple of years ago, said dance music was dead. What it was saying was that it was going to revert to type. It was never into dance music in the first place. Then dance music got big, and so it covered it. Now it's not as popular, so dance music's no it's good. Dead. Dance music can't die because people always want to dance. It's, it's obvious. It's a stupid statement to, to say. It, it, dance music evolves, and it, it's, it's, it's going to always be there. It always has been there, you know. And I think this next step for it, you know, I, I'm here, I'm sat in, in, in Australia, you know. I'm, uh, I, people here, that I was speaking on the radio last night to somebody, they're similar minded, they've got like an outlook that's the same as people I was talking to in New York last year or Italy last week when I was there or there's a global underground now, there's a linkage in all countries, at one time a scene used to be a regional thing, when I talk about the scene I was involved in it was in the north of England and involved the Midlands, the south of England was a different scene, now you know, we connect worldwide. This diff, you know, people come in. We've got the technology that we can link up worldwide. The merits of the internet. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And, you know, if people can take, you know, if people can draw from this and, and put their own, their own aspect into it and go with their own beliefs on this and interpret... I mean, it's like music's a magical thing and an ever-evolving thing that, all right, a lot of this music that maybe I play draws from the past. It's 20, 30 years old in certain cases. But if that connects with someone now, it means it's still alive. And of course it does. I mean, music stays that way. That's why classical music is still played now, because it transcends time. It's got a special quality. And so it's still developing now and people can take from that and people can you know add, add their own you know add their own side to that and and fuse their own ideas and take it in new directions and and this you know this is why like I feel particularly excited about where we're at at this point in time because on one level you know it, things have been forced to go back underground to a certain degree that whole super club era that you know that superstar DJ period, that whole thing of, you know, the DJ becoming, you know... A pop star. I, pardon? The, the DJ becoming yeah, a pop star. Yeah, I mean, I, I was never comfortable with what I saw there. Um, the idea that the DJ felt that they were somehow above the audience. I mean, I, re I remember, like, the early rave days. I remember somebody saying to me, and it was to do with... I was living in London at the time, and it was to do with one of the London clubs. It could have even been Shoe or Spectrum. And they said, there's this thing going on, and they're playing this. And they worship the DJ, was the word they used. And they all stand there, and they, they raise the, you know. And, and I remember thinking, 
feeling uneasy about that from a personal level because it was always about respect for me that if the audience respected you and you respect you know it was a, it was that was the so this new thing of the DJ being and and then you saw it like the way that a DJ will wait for a break of a record and they'll take the hands and take the acclaim <laughs> and you know the, okay that's showmanship and I understand that and but it's just not the way it, it's not the way that I was brought up on it in a sense so it didn't feel it didn't sit right with me and another thing that like was a big one when I, I realized what was happening was when people started talking about sets said oh you know he did, he did this he did this set and this word set always in the past used to be connected with bands it, a band wrote a set when they did a performance the band did a set a DJ didn't do a set a DJ played a spot or you know played a night you know when, when I used to DJ we did from nine o'clock till two o'clock the one DJ did the whole night there wasn't all the guests and everything that there are now now a DJ was doing a set and what, I was like what's this set what does this mean and when I realized that for a lot of people that meant all through the week they were practicing at home exactly what they were going to play <laughs> in the order they were going to play it mix for mix perfecting it getting that absolutely perfect that blew, that blew me away I thought okay really clever fantastic but where's the room for any spontaneity within this you're walking into a club knowing exactly how you you may as well in a sense be playing a tape because you, you know you it, it's taking away the, the whole premise of you know when I started out what it was about every individual situation you walked into the club you weighed up the audience that was in front of you you played your music according to what was there now all of a sudden you were deciding beforehand exactly what was going to be played and if you don't like what's going to be played you're stupid because I know best I'm the DJ my taste is better than yours which is wrong because it's subjective why is my taste better than yours? You like music, I like music. You might like different things than I do. It, we all work off certain vibrations and we all like certain things. What one person likes, the other person might not like so much. But to say, to, to, to assume that you know best and to, to assume that you're greater and your knowledge and your taste, you know, you, you know it, it's, it's like a wrong assumption. And, you know, don't get me wrong, this, from great DJs and they know what they're doing and they work in a certain way and I understand that but for a lot of people I think they 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 got wrong track and I remember meeting a guy right just before I started DJing I went on some of the, the, the websites and I met some people that way around and one was a young DJ and he happened to be from Liverpool and we met up and had a coffee and he was interested he discovered this this kind of period of time and we were talking and he, he you know he said what advice would you give me on a DJing level and I said you know don't don't plan exactly what you're gonna play walk in with your records of course you've got to kind of plan it to a level you've got to take what you've got and you can only work within that but don't, don't. and he, he was really shocked because he'd said well I was brought up to think that you had to, to have, a have to do that and you, you know I, I think that, that that stifles you rather than helps you by all means practice, by all means try and perfect your skills and everything, but have options. It's like, it's like now I'm still of that kind of uh, mind that, I, and it happened to me back then, I didn't like um, doing the set, I, I tried to avoid mixing the same record into, you know, like, you hear pe people used to talk back then even about, oh, I've got this mix and this record goes into that record. And, I almost wouldn't want to do that every time because it was force you. It was nailing me down to that. I tried to kind of do it differently with another record, and I even find that now when I kind of record, you know, like um, a, a night that I do, I don't, I don't like the idea that you know, I mix the same record. You know, I try to to, to vary it around. Um, I just think that 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 kind of if you start doing that, because you used to hear certain DJs and they'd, you'd know what record they were going to play next because they always used to mix the same record out of that. And it takes away the element of surprise 
and you know the the interest of you know like where you're going to go from here you know everything starts to become you know becomes regimented to a level and so you know I mean that's my feeling I mean some people might kind of disagree and think no it's got to you know we've got to kind of but I mean that's great for a mixtape brilliant but in a live setting working with actual live people who can respond in different ways the other thing that that, that, um, that uh, you know I kind of thinks you know uh, here's some some DJs will say you know somebody come up and ask me for a record and they really, really as though like in distaste that they come and ask me for something yeah how dare they you know like I'm the DJ I know and they ask me and it it's like Again, I come from a time when, when we used to use the microphone. One of the things we used to say, if you've got any requests or dedications you want, come and talk to me. People come and ask you for records. That was part of the deal. And sometimes someone can come and ask you for something that you hadn't thought of yourself on the spot. And it just turns out to be the perfect record. You've got to be open. You're working with, with people. You're not separate. Now, uh, you know, that's... that's how I see it, and I think... But sometimes they ask for Christina Aguilera too. But you can't play that if you don't play it. If you don't play it, you can't play it. That's fine. You know, sorry, I, I can't play that, I don't play that. But they might ask you for something that you just, you just haven't considered, you know. I mean, somebody did... Uh, the, I was in Manchester recently, and somebody came up, asked me to, you know... And it was a young guy as well, I mean, I was, it was a real strange request. And he said, could, could you play Gladys Knight in the Pits, Midnight Train to Georgia? It really made my night. And I thought, God, that's a really strange record to ask for. It's a great record, but an odd record. It's a slow record. And I, I just, yeah, I said, I'll see, you know, what I can do it. I knew I had it with me. And I played it at the end of the night, and it was just like, I couldn't believe the response. You know, everyone, it's like, I, th I thought most of people wouldn't even know the record. It was too old, and it just became the perfect record for that moment. You have it with you? It wasn't my decision. You have it with you right now? I have, but I mean, I don't think it would work in this context. <laughs> it's a different time and a different place. So, you know. But I, I just made a request. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got it with me. <laughs> OK, then you can play it. So uh, maybe we should open it up for questions? Definitely, yeah. Anyone? Um, wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Uh, firstly, thank you. That's thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Okay. My favourite Beatles song. Well, uh, it's hard to say what your favourite is. I've actually. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, 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 there's just so many. But what I would say is that I think you know, like people like funerals, they have a track played. I think it, it, for me, it'd be tomorrow never knows. That would be my track. Yeah. And the um, second one is, are there any secret records and legal Right, well, kind of. I'll tell you, uh, right, you know, look, Ruthless Rap Assassins, the, the band um, I work with, I mean, their, their first album was like Sample City. It was just like everything. I mean, everything is on that album from Hendrix, The Beatles, you know, The Stones, everything. It's, it's just like, it was at that time when, you know, like you weren't clearing. We were with EMI at the time, and um, somebody, it's like all the people at EMI were listening to the album. They heard um, what I'd done was I'd looped up the, the drum beats to Sergeant Peppers, and overdub into that. And somebody had heard, said, Isn't that the Beatles? And somebody like at EMI had said, There can't be any Beatles on this. And they sent a memo down saying, You know, like you've got to take off any Beatles. And I went to see the guy the head of the company and we completed the album at this point and to his credit he, he, he said go in the studio book a day in the studio but say you've changed it and they won't know any different and I didn't touch anything it stayed on there and it's like all the beats and stuff and there's all sorts of little sprinklings all over the album there's loads of stuff I mean <laughs> it's everywhere um, but the funny thing was that this day that we did, you know, like, um, I used it as a press day, invited everyone down to listen to the album. Um, we kind of had, like, um, 
what, what, did, what did we have? Like I got all these like mad little kaleidoscope things. It was like right at the height of the E period, and I think you know everything was a bit and like everyone like I loved spliffs kind of skinned up and everything out and brought them in, listened to the album in the studio in this in this system. Didn't do any work, just paid for a day. I had a great day listening, and um, and that it was fantastic. It was like a really wonderful day, but all the stuff stayed in there. So yeah, this like loads. I mean, one of the tracks is called To The Other MCs, and it's a kind of, you know, like in a hip hop tradition, it's like a kind of bragging track and everything. And, and I thought, well, what, what you know, because, uh, you know, within the, the con you know, within that um, context, they always allowed me my, I was, apart from the manager, I was the producer, and, and they, they, you know, allowed me to have my, my side into it, you know. And I thought, well, what, what can I use within that to, you know, what, what would I say? And so what I used and cut into it was um, Revolution 9 for the White Album. So there's like loads of that in there as well. I shouldn't be saying this, but there we go. <laughs> Thank you. In, in 2006, what music did you expect to? Um, I mean, like I said before, just the idea that um, this kind of a new generation of musicians, programmers who are kind of looking at a wider, a wider remit for music and taking from different directions, what people now call eclectic. I mean, I saw something the other night, you know, like on, on the TV, and it was Outcast, and they were talking about um, Kate Bush who I really like, I mean, I really like Kate Bush's stuff, and, and I just thought it was fantastic that they were, like, really into what she did and could, you know, and they were talking about the idea of, like, working with her, and, and that's what it says to me now is that, that, that a lot of barriers are broken down, that people aren't necessarily kind of pigeonholed into the areas that they should be into, and it's open, you know, and use that. that I mean, that, that, that's what hip-hop was originally. The original vibe of hip hop was take from wherever you can, and eventually, you know, it kind of became formularized like anything else, you know. But um, so yeah, you know, the, the fact that it's open and people, you know, it can go anywhere. Let it go where it wants to go. Go with your feelings on it. Uh, like maybe even last year, we sort of records, like just this year, like you know, releases in 2006 that really caught your ear. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's a Spirit Catcher track at the minute that I, I really like. Um, th I'm doing some, some work at the minute with Groove Armada, and um, also Tom Finley from Groove Armada's got another project called Sugar Daddy. And I like, I very much like the vibe of the stuff that's, that's on that. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's um, coming from different directions, like, that, that he's taken within that, you know, that um, it's not a specific, it's not staying in one area, it's kind of, so, yeah, I mean, basically, um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I like things like Kanye West and, you know, just good music. I mean, obviously, it's, again, it's a subjective thing what good music is, but, you know, I mean, I'm open to whatever, from whatever direction it's coming from. But in terms of a DJing sense, you know, um, as I say, you know, like things that are kind of... I suppose, you, you know, I mean, I've, I've obviously, I'm, I'm coming from a certain direction, so it's, it's stuff that's derivative from, you know, like, where I'm heading from. Although I can appreciate, you know, I mean, I hear a lot of good drum and bass stuff, or rather broken beat now, you know, and that I really like, but I wouldn't necessarily, it was, it's not stuff that, you know, I kind of play in with, with, with the type of stuff that I do. And so, just, you know, like, as I say, you know, um, from what, you know, I mean, whatever, direction that people come from as long as they're kind of coming from the heart with music, I suppose. I mean, I'm not so much into formularized, you know, like when people are going from that way. You, you, you can kind of hear the difference, I suppose. Anyone else? Yeah, if you want. Right. <laughs> I'll find it. This is, you know, I was talking before about this UK Electro album, this one that had um, 
It's supposed to be like this thriving electro scene with all these acts and it's all the same people. It's funny with this track myself that um, the first time I heard it played in a club was only a few years ago. I'd never heard it, you know, and it's like, did it in 1984? And um, here it is. You know, I got a lot of my influence from, with regards to the, the whole sampling thing, was, you know, British musician Brian Eno. He did an album with David Byrne called My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, which I thought was like, you know, used different um, kind of, you know, brought, well, sample the little tape stuff that he brought into it. And um, I thought that was like a revelation, you know, that, that album. Um, and that kind of had a big influence on where I was coming from with, with regards to sampling, whereas I think a lot of people, a lot of people were influenced a bit later down the line by the, the, the Paul Howcastle track 19, which I was never that keen on myself. I always found it a little bit, you know. I, I mean, interest, very good concept of the track and everything, but just a, a bit. A little bit, yeah, a little bit, I suppose. No, I mean, that was a different thing. I mean, it's like, we were talking about Ian Levine yesterday, and um, Ian Levine was the DJ at the Blackpool Mecca, which was like one of the Northern Soul Clubs. He was, um, he, he, he was probably the most influential of all Northern Soul DJs. Um, basically, you know, he was kind of a, a rich kid. His, his, his dad had businesses in the States. He used to go over there, and I think Miami, and he went into a warehouse and like went through all these records, and a lot of the kind of Northern Soul discoveries came from Ian Levine. Um, and he also, I mean, he hadn't come out at the time, but Levine's gay, and um, I think by going to the States, he went, he started going to uh, New York, and he saw what was going on there, and he kind of split the Northern Soul scene in the mid-70s by introducing disco alongside Northern tracks, whereas Wigan Casino kept it retro and there was a big schism in that scene from that. Levine later down the line became the DJ at Heaven, which was the, um, which was like the main gay club in London and was largely responsible for the high energy genre that came about its productions. But at the time when I made that, um, that sync beat track, um, there was a lot of kind of press at the time, and it was a big novelty, because I was saying before about English DJ remixing and all this, that an English DJ was involved in making music. I mean, a lot of the press things that came out, and one of the things that actually split up the people that I was working with was that there was a lot of onus put on this fact of a DJ making music, and, I, and one of the guys in particular, I think, um, there was a bit of an ego clash, and you know, he didn't so much like you know, that this, this kind of onus was being put on my side of it, as opposed to, you know, like, because he was from, from a kind of band who'd had hit singles and stuff like that. But that was just the novelty aspect which they came from. But having said that, I mean, this is like, for, for, for me and Levine's side, he was making records in the mid-70s. He is the original English DJ making music. He was, like, working with soul acts uh, from the States and doing tracks with them. And originally his kind of style was kind of derivative of, like, Northern Soul but eventually kind of moved more towards like a disco and high energy sound. He had like um, Barbara Pennington 24 hours a day, which, was, which took off in the States as well. So, you know, Ian Levine like predates any of the English DJs as like um, a kind of guy who, who got into actually producing and mixing his own stuff. So, you know, very much a pioneer. then I would like to thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you.